Welcome to Metal Miner's Sourcing Outlook. This month, we're going to examine an interesting piece on commodity stock performance and commodity prices. We'll cover the key metal markets, and we'll take a look at some alternative economic demand data. We're very excited to have Jennifer Diggins, Director of Public Affairs at Nucor, join us for our one-on-one -on -one segment. From the blog, my colleague asked the question, does recent commodity stock performance serve as a signal to where the underlying commodity price might go? This is the argument John Higgins posed in a recent Financial Times article. Higgins, a senior markets economist at Capital Economics, said, quote, The last time that resources, stocks, and actual raw materials prices diverged so much was in the summer of 2008, ahead of the start of the global financial crisis, end quote. According to the story, he said that in 2008, quote, Declines in the prices of commodity-related equities were a leading indicator of sharp falls in the prices of underlying commodities just a few months later, end quote. In other words, the prices of commodities were slow to react to the new reality. We believe that all of the two are likely statistically correlated. Resource stocks tend to wax and wane as the underlying commodity prices do. The reality is that today the entire stock market dipped for all stocks and all sectors. If commodity and resource stocks dropped before the commodity crash of 2008, we'd suggest it had more to do with weakening demand. Stocks drop as earnings disappoint. Earnings disappoint when commodity prices drop, demand weakens, margins decline, etc. In 2008, stocks likely weakened due to weakened demand and forward guidance, not the other way around. Moving on to Metal Watch. In practice, we've seen some minor corrections in many commodities, but the longer-term demand trends and short supply suggest this may only be a short-term correction. Let's take a closer look at copper, aluminum, and steel. Copper has fallen below $9,000 a ton. We believe at $88.50, and potentially still dropping, the Chinese will come back into the market to restock, pushing up prices in the process. Meanwhile, our friends at Harbor Aluminum still see some short-term drops ahead for the light metal due to market fear as measured by the VIX. In recent years, September has proved to be a good month to purchase aluminum, and Harbor believes aluminum will reach $3,000 a ton by May of next year. However, they have cautioned buyers about entering the market right now as they see some short-term downward pressure continuing. We have some interesting developments in the domestic steel market as prices have continued to slip while scrap prices remain at historical highs. As an example, with hot rolled coil prices in the low 30 cents per pound range and shredded scrap in the 22 cents per pound range, EAF producers have moved a lot closer to their marginal cost of production, which means steel producers may begin to look at taking capacity offline. However, we have also seen the first mill price increase announcements earlier this week, so we'll be watching this market closely. Now let's turn to Metal Miner Macro View. With all of the bad news stemming from the U.S. debt downgrade in a series of GDP revisions going back as far as 2008, we remain somewhat cautiously optimistic based upon some data coming from the Consumer Metrics Institute. Consumer demand makes up approximately 70% of the GDP equation. To get a better sense of the story, we refer to a few charts, also from the Consumer Metrics Institute, which approximate the absolute values of online consumer demand, where a value of 100 represents the year-long average consumer demand for the baseline year of 2005. So from a short-term perspective, the data examining absolute demand appears absolutely positive. That demand boost in July was enough to push the overall contraction chart into positive territory. However, we remain less than 100% positive about any recovery because the longer-term absolute demand trend remains tepid at best. Whereas the Consumer Metrics Institute believed the 2010 recovery was more vapor than substance, they also believe the economy appears to have bottomed. And if you follow the Bureau of Economic Analysis lag time in reporting actual GDP, the Consumer Metrics Institute believes we'll see one more bad quarter of GDP data, followed by a better report in Q1 2012. Unfortunately, Markets and sentiment have reacted to the lousy, antiquated, ever-changing BEA GDP data. Moving on to our one-on-one -on -one segment. 
We recently had the opportunity to sit down with Jennifer Diggins, Director of Public Affairs from Nucor, to chat about the state of U.S. energy policy and its impact on manufacturers. Here's what she had to say. I'd like to welcome our guest this morning, Jennifer Diggins, Director of Public Affairs at Nucor. Jennifer, I just want to get started with, you spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. Tell us what's going on there now, given all of what's happened with the debt ceiling discussions. What's going on from a legislative perspective? Well, I think everybody's catching their breath after a very long and partisan debate on the debt ceiling. Right now, nothing. Congress left town after they, they voted to raise the debt ceiling. Um, they won't come back until after Labor Day. So you start looking at the legislative days that are left between now and the end of the year, and there really aren't many. Can you give us an update as to where we stand with regard to EPA regulations on carbon emissions and anything else the EPA might be looking at? And then the follow-up would be, what are corporations planning for? What are they thinking about? Well, the EPA has been very active. There are a lot of expected regulations and rulemakings coming out, things that deal with greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the Supreme Court decision several years ago. And then they're taking a look at the ozone standard. So what we're planning for is sort of the unknown. There is a lot of uncertainty right now. Focus has been on greenhouse gas emissions, specifically carbon. Uh, but I would say uh, equally as important right now is the ozone standard. There's not supposed to be a review of the ozone standard until 2013. And what that really looks at is pollution across communities and who is in what they call attainment zones and unattainment zones. The reality is, is that to implement the review as EPA is saying that they'd like to implement it, it's going to be incredibly costly. And there are provisions in there that would allow the EPA to stop things like transportation and infrastructure projects if they were in communities that were found to be in non-attainment and these projects would lead to more air pollution. So it can be very costly, it can stop progress, and it's something that the Business Roundtable and groups like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce are really focused on right now and the uncertainty that brings to the business community. Second, I just want to ask you about um, ethanol subsidies. Are we going to see the U.S. Uh, removing ethanol subsidies? And what's the likely impact of that going to be? It was very interesting. This was a very hot topic for several months as Congress tried to reach an agreement for the curtailment of ethanol subsidies. Now, ethanol, the industry, really became the poster boy for energy subsidies as a whole. And there was an, a, a very good amount of time spent with members in the House and members of the Senate, especially members from regions where ethanol is a primary industry, trying to figure out a way to phase out these subsidies in the way that made the most sense. Surprisingly, that the agreement that had been reached was never included in the debt ceiling agreement that was signed by the president. Now, most view that agreement as dead and ethanol subsidies will continue. There likely won't be another piece of legislation that moves this year where that could be part of it. So it's expected that it will be business as usual, at least for the fall. Undoubtedly, the notion of subsidies is, is very hotly debated. And there seems to be some growing opposition to subsidies. Yet President Obama uh, is really yearning for the country to become more green. And he seems to suggest that we're going to need some of these subsidies to get those initiatives underway. And our question is really, what ought the role of the government be in terms of spurring new industries and new technologies from your perspective? Well, I think I'll start with the role that government ought not to take, which is the role of picking winners and losers in the energy debate picking politically popular energy forms to subsidize as a, in the hope that one day they will be more economical. You know, we are in such a delicate, you know, situation right now with our economy and our high unemployment rate. To continue throwing money at energy sectors in the hopes that they become more economical at the cost of the energy forms that already are economical seems like a very misguided notion.